Welcome everyone. On behalf of the Australian Institute for Disaster Resilience, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for this, the fourth and final day of the Australian Disaster Resilience Conference Presents Knowledge Week. Uh, this afternoon, our focus is on a session entitled Business Fostering Resilience, and we've got quite, a, quite an array of speakers and sessions for the afternoon. My name's Andrew Coughlin, and I head up the Emergency Services Program at Australian Red Cross. Uh, and Australian Red Cross is very pleased to be a partner in the work of the Institute of ADA, having been involved since its inception, along with both EMA and, of course, the team at AFAC and ADA. Today, we're going to start off with a thought-provoking panel, looking at the question, what do we need to be resilient to? A really, I think, timely question, given the circumstance we're living in at present. I'm coming to you from Melbourne, where we're still in COVID lockdown. And of course, other parts of the country, we've come from uh, drought through bushfire and more recently floods in some part of the country. So it's a very pertinent question, I think, this afternoon. It'll be followed by presentations under the theme of business fostering resilience. And I'm delighted to be able to host uh, the afternoon session for you today. I should start by acknowledging that I'm hosting this conference from the lands of the people of the Kulin Nation and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you're all joining us from today across Australia and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this conference in particular. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate and acknowledge the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connection to the lands and waters across Australia. Important to, I think, reflect also on the impact of some of the disasters we've had in recent times on our First Nations people as well. A couple of brief housekeeping notes just before we get into things so that you make the most of your time with us this afternoon. Please share your conference experience on Twitter using the hashtag ADRC20, ADRC20, and be sure to check out the virtual posters as well. If you have any trouble viewing the PowerPoint slides in our Zoom session today, please follow along using the PDF copy of the slides that's available on today's program page, which also contains further information about each of our speakers. The ADA team will also share that link in the chat window shortly. We're using the Q&A feature in Zoom again today for questions for those of you who've been with us over the last few days. So please use that rather than the chat function and make sure you keep questions and votes coming through during the presentations. We've got time allocated at the end of each of the sessions uh, for some good questions and discussions. So please type those in as we go and as you think of them. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Melissa Parsons, who will be moderating our first panel on what do we need to be resilient to. Melissa is a senior lecturer at the University of New England in Armidale with research interests in both social and environmental resilience. Melissa led the development of the Australian Disaster Res Resilience Index for Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC, a project that produced the first national scale snapshot of disaster resilience here in Australia. Welcome and over to you, Melissa, thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew. Hello and welcome to everyone. I acknowledge that today I am here on the country of the Anawan people. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here at today's panel session. I'd like to warmly welcome our panel for today. Toby Kent, Cheryl Durant, Shane Fitzsimmons and Michael Crawford. Michael has very kindly stepped in at the last minute for Rob Cameron due to some unforeseen circumstances. So how this session is going to run is that we'll hear from each of the panellists for around five minutes and then we'll bring together everyone at the end for questions. There's several hundred people who are going to be online, so please enter your questions, as um, Andrew said, into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and vote for any questions that you'd like to see addressed. So, drought, bushfire, pandemic. Large scale, record breaking events that have affected the lives and the livelihoods of millions of Australians. 
But what these events have brought really front and centre is the interconnectedness of our world and the interconnected social, environmental, economic, institutional and political systems which feed back on each other to influence the outcomes of disaster or natural hazard events. Now, all of this is also occurring alongside the existential risk of climate change. We know that all sorts of policies and programs are being designed and implemented to address risk and resilience. The, national, the recently released National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework seeks to address the systemic risk that makes us vulnerable. And as we've heard a lot about over the last few days of the conference, we are seeking to build resilient communities amid a whole lot of pressures and entrenched inequalities that have yet to be overcome in many places. So in the midst of a sequence of cascading events, drought, bushfire, pandemic, can we review what it is that we need to be resilient to? Toby, Cheryl, Shane and Michael all bring substantial leadership and public policy experience to this question and are going to today offer us some insight and framing of, different, from, of, of that question from different perspectives. So I'd now like to welcome our first panel speaker, Toby Kent. Toby is the former Chief Resilience Officer for Melbourne and a partner at Alice Kent. Toby has worked internationally to help major corporate, government and non-government organisations achieve their commercial and operational objectives. Toby was Australia's first Chief Resilience Officer and created and delivered Australia's first urban resilience strategy, Resilient Melbourne, which was a collaboration across Melbourne's 32 councils. Uh, also bringing in state, private and not-for-profit organisations. Thank you, Toby. Many thanks, Melissa, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge, uh, as everyone and the others have in setting this up, the traditional custodians. Um, and now as we move into thinking about what do we need to be resilient to, I'm really going to um, just spend a few minutes um, playing with the word um, because the word in and of itself has uh, a certain power and value. Uh, and then uh, the other panelists uh, are going to take us into some of the specific uh, hazards uh, that we need to be resilient to. So as a word, um, resilience, uh, its time has certainly come. Uh, indeed, we're uh, arguably in a situation where we may well be approaching peak resilience. Uh, as it is uh, used to uh, do everything from advertising baby formula to providing the titles of urban plans through to sporting biographies. And one of the reasons for this that it is, um, as a word, intrinsically understood, it is a profoundly human quality. And so unlike certain other uh, governmental and technical words, we within ourselves kind of immediately understand what people are talking about uh, when they speak about resilience. On the flip side, uh, a bit like scenario planning, one of the reasons why uh, resilience is uh, such a used word at the moment is because we live uh, in profoundly challenging times. So scenario planning is used when we really don't understand what lies ahead really came to the forefront in the 1970s in the uh, face of the oil crisis and it is being used at unprecedented levels at the moment. And so if resilience serves uh, equality um, uh, is being used now, it's because uh, we are living in a time of unprecedented uncertainty and arguably anxiety as well. Um, perhaps the only thing that is truly certain about our current sense of direction uh, is the volume and velocity of the change uh, that is coming that is unprecedented. So being resilient uh, is a way of encouraging um, all of us in a sense to strap in uh, in the face of this complexity uh, in a way that's immediately understandable. Now that said, 
um, there is a value to having a specific uh, definition of the word because one of the, the weaknesses of it is because it means something to all of us, um, we all interpret uh, it in a slightly different way. Having worked uh, with the concept uh, a lot um, over a number of years, I still find the uh, definition used by the Global Resilient Cities Network um, the most valuable, and that is that resilience is about the ability of institutions, organizations, systems, businesses, and fundamentally communities and individuals, and their ability to adapt, survive, and thrive in the face of whatever chronic stresses and acute shocks that we face. Now, the value of that is that the definition is both specific, specific enough to have meaning, while flexible enough to, to apply uh, at a range of, of scales from the household to the national. It also uh, is relevant in a range uh, of, of contexts in terms of the hazards and the challenges that we face. And importantly, this point about being thrived in the definition uh, talks both to what uh, Melissa was speaking about in terms of um, uh, the uh, addressing inequity uh, and is also really puts in the center of the definition this concept of kind of bouncing forward, not just bouncing back when things go wrong, but actually positioning ourselves better. Now, before I um, kind of use up the final bit of time, I'd also like to just touch on some of the challenges of this concept. Because resilience is something that is fundamentally human. It's also something that we all think we either do possess or should possess. And thus, it becomes a very charged word, um, a word that can actually be damaging, particularly uh, following events. Um, there are essentially two ways that communities hear the word resilience once they have been impacted um, by a uh, catastrophic event. Either um, they are affronted because they feel that they are resilient uh, and somehow that resiliency is not being acknowledged, or perhaps even more damaging, uh, they hear the use of the word resilience as essentially meaning that they are on their own. And I certainly think that during the Black Summer fires, uh, our recent uh, catastrophic fires, that word uh, resilience, um, which as I say, can be so powerful as an organizing concept, began to be co-opted and corrupted uh, by some of our politicians. The other thing sticking at the political realm uh, and is that uh, in the work that I did particularly with Resilient Melbourne, people would sometimes say, ah, but you know, but resilience isn't always good. Look at our political systems or our development models. They are resilient, we can't change them. That is not resilience, that is a misapplication of the word, that is resistant. Resilience, uh, systems that are resilient embrace change, work with change, they don't resist it. And so quickly touching on the qualities of resilience, um, there are, as we refer to it in the Resilient Cities Network, seven qualities of resilience. And I won't go through them all now. Some of them are obvious, like being robust and being flexible, but one of them is redundancy and that's spare capacity. So in terms of coming back to this question about what do we need to be resilient to, one of our challenges in this uh, space of resilience is redundancy. We live in a world that has um, championed and fought hard uh, to pursue efficiency. But, uh, and, and that is you know, best exemplified by the world of lowest cost procurement. But resilient systems love spare capacity. And as we see it at the moment where we have in the past seen ourselves as sophisticated and intelligent, the way that we have shared resources uh, in the firefighting space in particular with our North American counterparts. And now we see that the same interoperability brings with it intervulnerabilities. Uh, and so um, that is something that uh, I think as we get into the guts of what we need to be 
uh, resilient to thinking about um, this our, our interconnectivity both as a strength and as a weakness uh, is something we we need to understand and embrace so in concluding the value of the concept of resilience is our willingness and ability to prepare and to be flexible um, it's about understanding as well the potentially charged nature of the word and its limitations which should inform its application in a broad range of situations in terms of those situations we'll get into more detail uh, i.e the specifics around what we need to be resilient to with the panelists to whom I shall now hand over. Thanks very much, Toby. Just a reminder to people to please place any questions that, that you'd like to ask into the Q&A box rather than, than the, the chat box um, so that we can gather a set of questions to um, so that the panelists can discuss all those at the end. So I'd like to now introduce Cheryl Durant, climate emergency strategist. Cheryl has over 30 years experience in the national security sector, including specialist army intelligence and defense capability and preparedness roles. Cheryl led the department's global change and energy sustainability initiative from 2013 to 2016 and established the position of the Australian Defense Forces Climate and Security Advisor. She also supported the development of the National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework and the co-design of the Profiling Australia's Vulnerability Report. Over to you, Cheryl. Thanks. So thanks, Melissa. And being a more traditional defence and security thinker, I'm going to start with the threats uh, in answering the question, what do we need to be resilient to? So working in defence, we tended to focus on some really big existential risks because it's often the, the bigger, more high impact events that catch us out and we need to be resilient to. And we're looking at three risks or threats or hazards uh, in particular. One was the likelihood of global war. One was the impact that accelerating climate change could have on, on global governance. And the final one was looking at some of the new emerging military technologies and threats such as cyber warfare. And as Melissa has said, and as I think we've heard from a number of presenters throughout the week, all of these threats are sort of interconnected now. They're sort of systemic and messy and, and amplify and impact upon each other. Who would have thought one year ago that a health hazard would have such an impact on econ economics and society and supply chains? So really, this can be quite challenging and also the threats tend to be converging. And when we looked at both military threats and climate change, we were surprised at how similar they were on impacts on society. For example, the new military threats, which is cyber threats, hybrid warfare, information warfare, grey zone warfare, are no longer requiring us to sort of necessarily envisage armies and air forces and navies traveling across terrain to seize country. These new technologies allow military forces to, to directly target critical infrastructure services, information systems, and societal attitudes at precision and at scale. And curiously, these now look similar to how climate effects might play out, whether it's a natural hazard causing problems to a communication tower or whether it's an adversary doing a cyber attack, the impact on a community or a business or a nation actually look quite similar. So as I began to, to sort of continue to evolve my thinking about what do we need to be resilient to, I found it more useful to look, instead of at the threats and hazards and risks, because some, that they can be challenging and overwhelming, but to focus instead upon the key business impacts. And uh, Melissa mentioned earlier the Australian vulnerability profile. So ask ourselves the questions to unpack the first question, and there are two of them that I find useful. The first is, what do I actually need? And this question can be applied at, at multiple scales. You can apply it at an individual scale. What do I need? Uh, family, communities, business, regions, towns, cities, nations, or even planets. And the other question is, what makes me vulnerable? And often it's not your strengths. It's, it's the bits that you don't think about. So one of the major pieces of work I led in defence was a study into national supply chain. And the question we asked ourselves then was not, 
how is that impacted by climate change or how is that impacted by war or how is that impacted by a cyber attack? But instead we asked ourselves, what would happen if our supply chain was interrupted? So basically global supply was cut off in different time frames because timing, timing is important. You can be resilient for two days, but not resilient for one week. So it's critical to think about time. So we got together a group of experts and, and posed the question, what would happen if Australia's supply was cut off for one day, one month, or one year? And that elicited different answers, which helps us to understand what we needed to be run, not what we needed to be resilient to. And they weren't necessarily the ones we'd, we'd anticipated. We anticipated um, issues with fuel, because it's a, a fairly well-known uh, topic in Australia, but we hadn't anticipated issues around wastewater chemicals and their criticality for um, infrastructure. And the final thing I really just want to, to mention before uh, I sort of wrap up is this criticality of time, because often we can be resilient in the short term, but create problems in the long term. An example of this today might be, for example, uh, in coastal erosion, which is quite topical if you're living on the, the south coast of Australia. So you can do some things like pour concrete, which would make your uh, houses and communities more resilient to coastal erosion now and, and might for a number of years. But concrete's a very high carbon emitting material. So what you're going to be doing with that is also creating and contributing towards sea level rise in the longer term. So when you're thinking about what you need to be resilient to, it's also critical, I think, to answer the question, what do you need to be resilient when? So I'm just going to wrap up my opening comments there. Thanks very much, Cheryl. So let's move through now, um, keep going and move to hear from Shane Fitzsimmons, Commissioner of Resilience, New South Wales. Uh, I, I think Shane is, um, is here. I just can't sit here. Shane Fitzsimmons was appoint appointed as the inaugural Commissioner for Resilience New South Wales and Deputy Secretary Emergency Management within the Department of Premier and Cabinet starting in May this year. This appointment, of course, as most of you know, followed a very distinguished career with the New South Wales Fire Service um, spanning over 35 years. So thank you, Shane, and over to you on your take on the question, what do we need to be resilient to? Uh, thank you, thank you, Melissa, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to join uh, and share some thoughts and experience and observations on this very, very important subject. As we've been reflecting on um, the last 12 months or so particularly, um, in New South Wales, uh, we've seen communities right across the state profoundly affected uh, by a very debilitating drought. As a matter of fact, the drought ended up certainly priming the landscape and the vegetation for what turned out to be the worst ever bushfire season experienced in New South Wales. Um, the absence of moisture in the landscape, the susceptibility of ignition, flammability and fire spread, uh, particularly across our mountain ranges uh, from the Queensland border to the Victorian border uh, was extraordinary. Uh, then of course, as we saw the very unusual and unprecedented weather event finally break up with, uh, with the monsoonal activity up in Northern Australia, uh, we saw then uh, storms and floods impacting communities of New South Wales. And now we've got everybody uh, affected by the ubiquitous nature of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and all the, all the response uh, activities and arrangements that are necessary to try and save uh, and preserve life. Uh, even in the midst of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we've also seen more East Coast lows uh, and additional significant rainfalls, localised flooding and damage as a result of <clears throat> storm and, and flood events. So in terms of setting that scene, uh, first and foremost, uh, as has been articulated by other speakers, we are talking about communities uh, right across New South Wales um, that have been affected by not necessarily 
one major disruption or one major disaster. Uh, but for some of these communities, for some of these individuals, for some of these businesses and families um, and, and, and industry sector, uh, they've been affected by two, three, uh, four or more events uh, that have profoundly affected, disrupted uh, and damaged their, uh, their way of operating, their way of living, their way of working and functioning uh, as local communities. We know through the research um, that uh, we have we have a wonderful culture in Australia, uh, um, and one of those wonderful cultural traits uh, I've spoken about publicly before is, she'll be right, mate. Uh, she'll be right. It won't happen to me. So we've got to do something uh, about breaking down uh, this challenge uh, of people not realising that things do always have and can happen. Uh, and will happen into the future uh, in their space, in their place, in their world, their community, their business. Unlike the drought, unlike the bushfires, unlike storms and floods, the thing that has really brought state, national and global attention is that an event like COVID, no one is immune, no one is isolated from the challenges and implications. So in building resilience uh, and picking up on the definitions uh, that's been used previously by Toby, uh, which is a good one, how do we make sure from prevention to recovery um, that we are giving confidence to communities, to individuals, to families, to business, uh, to live, to work, uh, to invest, um, um, uh, grow and thrive uh, in a constantly changing and challenging environment? We know um, uh, the toll has been enormous. Um, uh, and if, if I just pick up the, uh, the bushfire season alone, uh, a scale like we've never seen before in New South Wales, don't get me wrong, I don't detract from the nation's worst ever bushfire disaster in Victoria back on Black Saturday, where 173 people died uh, in, in one afternoon. But for New South Wales, we had fires from the, from the Queensland border to the Victorian border. I won't refer to the last season as the, as the Black Summer fires because it's inaccurate and it detracts from so many communities uh, that were impacted, that lost livelihoods, that lost businesses, that lost homes, that lost loved ones uh, in the months outside uh, of summer. As a matter of fact, in New South Wales, we were averaging more than a thousand fires a month during the months of winter, June, July and August. And it only intensified as we came into the spring and summer uh, with lives being lost uh, along the way. Uh, two lives lost in in, in October, uh, seven lives lost in November, another five lives lost in December, uh, and uh, uh, 12 lives lost in, in January, including uh, aerial firefighters uh, and our own volunteer firefighters. Uh, that tested the resolve and the resilience of communities far and wide. Uh, I saw a resolve and a commitment of the men and women day after day, volunteers, salaried alike, giving of themselves, putting themselves in between fire fronts and people's livelihoods and businesses and communities and families, uh, trying to make a difference day after day, week after week, month after month. The resilience of those people to get up and come back every day. So too did we see communities being impacted and decimated and damaged and affected uh, again and again and again. And the toll was enormous. The toll continues to be enormous as we stretch through into, into this COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, and everybody being affected in terms of how we operate, live, function and work. To me, building resilience is actually about uh, not just um, uh, the, the full cycle of the, you know, uh, hypothesising and forecast and predicting and scenario planning the events, but understanding the investments around prevention and mitigation and, and planning, obviously an effective response, but then helping people through the recovery. Um, uh, recovery, rebuilding and healing. And whilst we talk a lot about infrastructure, uh, buildings, things, bridges, roads, all those critical infrastructure elements, how do we not only uh, rebuild them and replace them, but how do we ensure uh, across government, through government, coordinating uh, with our national partners, how do we make sure we've got betterment and improvement in what was there before the event? And the classic example is timber bridges. Um, Bridges burn down generally in each fire or they get damaged to the point of di uh, disrepair. 
and historically replace them with another bridge. Well, this time round, we're replacing them all with concrete bridges. And not only are we replacing them with concrete bridges, but if it's appropriate and and, and in, in the remit at the, at the time, we're raising the height of that concrete bridge because it'll also assist with, with isolation from localised floods and those sorts of things. So, so it starts at the individual, family, business, community, government. No one individual, no one organisation, no one government can do it on their own. It's about all of us individually and collectively coming together. Thanks very much, Shane. Again, I'd like to remind people to please ask any questions in the Q&A panel down the bottom of the screen and we will go back to the panellists um, in a few minutes and, and answer those questions. But I'd like to now introduce our final panellist, um, Michael Crawford. Hi, Michael. Um, Michael Hello. is Acting Assistant Secretary for Disaster Risk Reduction at Emergency Management Australia, which of course is in the Department of Home Affairs. He has more than 20 years experience in customs, law enforcement, national security, civil maritime security, capability development and organisational reform. He focused on disaster risk information services as part of the National Resilience Task Force and um, at the moment, he's leading the Disaster Risk Reduction Branch in Emergency Management Australia. So over to you, Michael, to hear your take on the question. Thanks. Thanks, Melissa, and uh, hello, everybody, uh, this afternoon. I think uh, uh, an apology is uh, a poor way of saying hello, but uh, I feel some, somewhat that you've been shortchanged in, uh, in missing out and hearing from uh, the Director General of EMA, Rob Cameron, uh, he's unable to join us. So uh, um, you might not also be aware that uh, that Rob Cameron is scheduled to retire um, from the public service on, on the 4th of September. So with the with the indulgence of the, the moderator and everyone uh, tuning in, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge the uh, significant contribution of Rob Cameron as a national leader in this area. Um, my take on, uh, on this question is that it can, um, uh, it, it risks m missing the point um, somewhat, um, in that it can um, push us to a traditional hazard-based uh, approach to, to the issue. Uh, and perhaps uh, another way of considering this uh, uh, and echoing, echoing what, what Cheryl had to say was, um, you know, a, a consideration of what we value, um, what we value most and how those things are vulnerable. And as another step to that, um, what we're willing to trade off in terms of providing um, greater confidence or reducing the vulnerability of those things. Uh, so natural hazards, like as other hazards, um, uh, essentially become disasters when they impact our communities and those things we value uh, and push them beyond their ability to cope. Uh, as disaster risk grows, uh, our resilience diminishes. Um, and so reducing disaster risk is, is essential to increasing our, our resilience uh, now and into the future. Um, our emergency services and emergency management agencies are, are well, world class and this is continuously displayed uh, most recently through, through Black Summer fires and, uh, and also just taking this opportunity to, to acknowledge the, uh, the leadership of Commissioner Fitzsimmons uh, in this regard. Uh, however, in the, rate, the wake of recent events, we need to observe what worked and what doesn't, uh, not just immediately, but over the long term. On 30th of June uh, this year, uh, the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation presented its report on climate and disaster resi resilience to the Prime Minister. This report and the underpinning technical report have also been provided to the Royal Commission into natural, National Natural Disaster Arrangements. The report details recommendations for building resilience, providing further guidance on practical actions uh, to build on the foundation of the National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework. The Royal Commission, together with other state and territory inquiries, are also central to understanding this issue. Some of the early themes that are emerging from both the Royal Commission and the uh, CIRA report are pointing to some clear themes that we need to collectively work together to better understand our risks. We need to do more collectively to reduce our risks. 
noting that we all have a responsibility, but that responsibility is not necessarily equal. And we need to do more to collectively share our resources. These themes are being made more relevant as we experience the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Over the past couple of years, there have been some significant achievements that are shifting the way we, as a society, are pro proactively reducing our vulnerability and building our resilience. The National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework is foundational, uh, and I note that it's in the um, Knowledge Hub of the ADAR website, uh, and I might ask that the ADAR team uh, include those links uh, as, as appropriate. Um, the framework captures a shared vision for all sectors to make disaster risk informed decisions and reduce the risks within their controls. Developing the framework was a truly national effort with representatives across all jurisdictions, government, industry and the community involved. Uh, that includes Cheryl, who's a member of this panel. Um, the framework was endorsed by the then um, Council of Australian Governments on 13 March this year. And a national action plan, the first national action plan has been developed to support the implementation of the framework. The first national action plan was endorsed by national emergency management ministers on the 22nd of May and is currently with the Prime Minister for consideration. I note that it's um, been provided also to the Royal Commission and has been publicly released on the Royal Commission's website. So uh, those attending this, uh, this um, conference might wish to go to the Royal Commission website and uh, access it there. Importantly, the National Action Plan details practical actions that the Australian Government and others are taking to deliver on framework outcomes. This includes, for example, completing the pilot uh, into the National Disaster Risk Information and Services capability. It also highlights the array of important work underway in jurisdictions and other sectors in relation to disaster risk reduction. This includes cross-sector collaboration with the Insurance Australia Group, uh, National Australia Bank, CSIRO, uh, and others, um, which I understand will be a following um, presentation uh, around resilient investment. These initiatives reduce risk, re disaster risk and collectively build community resilience to disruption from natural hazards, climate change, and other risks. In addition to the framework and the National Action Plan, the Australian government and other governments are committing 261 million over, the, over five years for practical disaster risk reduction initiatives. In addition, there's uh, $26.1 million uh, allocated over five years for national initiatives. And we're currently consulting with our state and territory colleagues on these uh, initiatives at the moment. Uh, one such example is a national bushfire intelligence capability. Um, together with the states and territories, we're also developing a monitoring, evaluation and learning framework uh, to improve our understanding about how to best progress the systemic changes needed to reduce systemic disaster risk. Measuring systemic change is hard. And to be effective, it needs high levels of collaboration and a willingness to test assumptions to ensure we're collectively doing the right things to reduce risk. The Australian Government has also worked with ADA to deliver a series of national forums to disseminate world leading thinking on systemic disaster risk and vulnerability. And these have been published on the uh, ADA Knowledge, uh, Knowledge Hub. Through this going engagement and delivery of practical initiatives, we consistently see the determination and unity across all governments to reduce disaster risk and build a more disaster resilient Australia. With the frequency and intensity of natural hazards forecast to increase and the future high risk weather seasons to commence earlier, lasting longer and have more severe impacts on Australian communities, there's a community expectation that we can act sooner to protect lives, livelihoods, property and the community. Collectively, we need to learn from the past and ensure that these lessons are applied to reduce the risks that we face and make improvements where we can. So thank you and I'll hand back to, to Melissa. Thanks very much, Michael. 
So um, I'm going to go now quickly through to a couple of questions. We've got about um, 15 to 20 minutes remaining and there's a few questions that are coming through. So I'm going to start with a question that maybe goes to the backgrounds of, of each of you in the government sector um, and, and, but also experiences in other sectors. And that is about good public policy and the role that good public policy can play in addressing disaster risk reduction and disaster resilience. We've heard today about a few of those things, the disaster resilience strategy, which then morphed into the, the national risk reduction framework. We know there's state level uh, resilience, community resilience frameworks, establishment of agencies such as Resilience New South Wales. How can we use good public policy and good public institutions and strategies as drivers of change for what you've all talked about and from an academic perspective appears to be quite a radical change that's needed to prepare for the future. So maybe we'll start, um, I think, with Cheryl on, on that one. So thanks, Melissa. Um, certainly the framework I found useful um, in answering this question is the one that was used in the Australian Vulnerability Report. That was to look at things through the lens of processes, knowledge and values. And certainly the policy piece sits in the process piece. And as coming from Army, which was more a focus on knowledge and action, I really um, became more to value important policy. And not just for setting the right incentives, but one thing policy... Um, can provide or can avoid is the perverse incentives. And so we had some discussion about that, that coastal erosion and land use. So things like land use, which are not necessarily on the, on the forefront of everyone's mind in a bushfire, are critically important to get right to make ourselves more resilient in the future. And really that, that change is going to come from a policy setting. So an, another angle on that, on that uh, question as well is that I think we all need to work on the premise that no policy is effective unless it's got an applicability locally. And, and, and as we're seeing here in New South Wales at the moment, even though we've got communities affected by similar disasters or disruptions, no one local community, no one family, no one business, no one sector is affected in the same way. Their predisposition and their position coming into the event and their situation thereafter is very different. So we've got to make sure that, that policy is around intent uh, uh, and purpose, but then we've got to make sure that we are absolutely able to provide flexibility and nuance to applicability and effect locally. The best led planning, the best led response, the best led recovery is that which is locally led, providing we are effectively enabling, sponsoring, endorsing, and assisting uh, in, that, in that local effort. Thanks. Michael. Uh, uh, from my perspective, uh, and coming from the, the Commonwealth's uh, perspective, I think it's a, it's a question of balancing um, the responsibilities and enabling uh, an authorising environment. Uh, so uh, combining um, some practical measures that uh, require high levels of resourcing and uh, an aggregation of, of action at a national level, um, potentially around things like uh, information. Um, uh, with the governance arrangements that provide uh, the permission of action and um, some of the incentive, uh, incentivised frameworks that, that allow other sectors uh, to work coherently to to an overall objective. Toby, um, I mean, I think it's building what the uh, others have already said. But true resilience is often built in spite of government uh, rather than thanks to government. Uh, and I think uh, you know Shane has spoke about the importance of it being locally led, and uh, and I think. Um, that absolutely resonates. And yet at the same time, one of the reasons why uh, resilience is such a popular concept at the moment is because our vulnerabilities are shared uh, and, you know, we are all in it together. And so my final point on this, um, 
which you know I can say now the nice thing about being outside of government uh, is um, I really don't have to make any effort to be diplomatic um, is that um, that given that we're all in it together uh, and given that climate change and its impacts are such a shared uh, issue not having a sensible uh, or even vaguely credible uh, approach to climate change mitigation at a national level, I think fundamentally undermines the ability of the national government to have a uh, strong and encouraging position as it rates, relates to a whole range of resilience issues. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so we're getting a few questions through that all relate to the theme of interconnectedness. So um, I guess another question that I want to put to the panel um, is that really, while once these um, things like, uh, that they, they might have been viewed through different lenses um, of national security, climate change, pandemic um, through, through a health perspective and disaster risk reduction through an emergency management perspective, are these now actually all the same problem? And what's your take on how these relationships have developed through time? And um, we've already heard a little bit about how they seem to be naturally coming back together again as a umbrella public policy issue. Maybe we'll start again, uh, we'll start again with Cheryl. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. I actually, uh, my original degree was in history and I think history tells us a lot because if you went back 2000 years, there wouldn't be, you know, 25 different variants of government trying to address a policy. So we, we've had this splintering effect and a very siloing effect as, as we developed over the thousands of years of human history. And now we're finding big crises where that siloed effect doesn't really work. And so we need to have both a process that integrates local thinking, local knowledge, which a number of panelists have, have emphasised, but also with expert knowledge as well. And we need to break out of the different silos of home affairs and defence and foreign affairs and trade and health and, and bring that group of experts together with businesses, with communities to try and tackle problems. And how you do that is, of course, the, the difficult one, because if anyone's been to a meeting with sort of 36 attendees, it's, it's difficult to, uh, and Toby smiling there, difficult to get to positive outcomes. But we also have amazing technologies that are now us to network um, differently and more effectively. So I think we need to bring those modern technologies together so more people can be a shared part of the um, identification of the problem and the solution. Um, I, I would um, somewhat, uh, echo Cheryl's uh, comments probably less eloquently uh, in that we, um, uh, we, we have to move beyond um, the current silos. Uh, the silos of, of, of policy operational and functional responsibilities uh, are, are no longer sufficient to, to address the challenges. Um, I think this is, this is finding those things that we're um, across, uh, across the whole economy committed to around a safe, uh, prosperous and secure Australia uh, and finding the mechanisms that we can work up uh, and down and horizontally uh, from local to national uh, and across the different sectors and, and finding the mechanisms for uh, inspiring and aligning effort uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and making uh, um, uh, complementary contributions to action. Thanks. Shane, interconnectedness. And uh, is yeah, thank you, Melissa. So, so in a way, that's really underpinning the establishment of Resilience New South Wales. So Resilience New South Wales has been established as an executive agency in the Department of Premier and Cabinet, um, very deliberately so, to ensure that there is a reach right across government. Uh, we are not attached to one department or, or, or a subset of one large agency, reaching right across government uh, through the through the um, policy instruments and the legislative frameworks is to have reach and connectedness uh, with local government, local community, um, and certainly in our capability frameworks, uh, a big investment with industry, uh, business, um, um, and relationships across our jurisdictional borders, but then also uh, the conduit to the national uh, arena uh, where we can influence and uh, connect 
um, uh, the mechanisms and the frameworks to that local delivery. So, so absolutely, it's fundamental. And even in even with the recovery effort we've got going on now, the largest recovery effort we've ever experienced in New South Wales, uh, we have got we have got a uh, dozens of stakeholders from across government, industry, business, uh, collaborating together, working together, defining local um, uh, recovery plans, state recovery plans to ensure we're trying to buy in that community profile um, um, relevant to each given area, but sharing the experiences and 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 sharing the investments and the supplementation to, to give effect to what they need and when they need it and why they need it. Um, Melissa, if I'm able to um, to just jump in there as well, uh, just to echo uh, um, Shane's comments. We're seeing a new era, um, particularly the national um, coordination uh, with the uh, replacement of COAG with the National Cabinet, um, uh, wanting to break down those silos even at a federated level. Um, but looking at the, the council structures that sit off uh, the previous COAG and now uh, new national cabinet, and looking for the mechanisms that we can mainstream resilience and disaster risk, not, a, not as potentially a standalone council, but maybe as an as a, as a integral element in each of the councils to consider climate disaster risk and resilience as part of their operations and business. Fantastic. Thanks, Michael. Um, so we're just down to the last couple of minutes of the panel session. So I wanted to talk about hope. These are challenging issues that you and your agencies are leading. These are challenging issues that um, all the people listening um, to the panel are also working with. How can we maintain hope for the future? And how can that be translated through the work that's being done in policy and programs? And, and I'd like to start with, with Toby. Well, I, I began talking about resilience as an innately human quality. Uh, and in the same way, uh, I think one of the things that sits behind humans success uh, is a, an innate um, orientation towards hope and optimism. Uh, there's been an awful lot of uh, scientific studies, increasing numbers that have looked at optimism uh, as a trait. Uh, and, you know, it's something that um, you know, uh, entrepreneurs in particular um, have to have uh, that willingness uh, at you know an extreme level to aim for the skies uh, and hope you know, or fundamentally believe that you're going to get there. But a really basic level, uh, and it sounds prosaic, but hope is what gets us each out of bed every day uh, as well. And so um, I think uh, the more that we can, as agencies, uh, help individuals to understand the role that uh, they each play in, in, in moving us for all forwards. Uh, I think that will, uh, is a really important part of our collective hope. Thanks. I might go over to Shane. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. For me, um, hope is central to what we're talking about. And, and whilst we've seen and we continue to see the very worst in mother nature, the very worst in disaster and what it brings. Uh, parallel to that, we've seen the very best in humanity. We've seen a very genuine and sincere outpouring of love, support, compassion, care, and that's manifested itself um, uh, through governments, through communities, through business, um, um, in a scale that, that we can only truly be proud of. Like it's against all odds that people are coming together legitimately as i won't use the phrase black summer i won't use the phrase social distancing it's actually about physical distancing i know where the phrase came from and all that sort of thing but what we don't want to do is add to loneliness isolation uh despair and and um uh depression so so the hope is um, you, don't get me wrong, you've got the moronic element that pop up in our news feeds every now and then about they're in denial and they're refusing to, to do things, but that's not the mainstream people. Uh, people are genuinely in this together. Uh, they are seeking to individually, at a family level, at a community level, a, a, at a workplace level, um, pull together, work together, and we've got to reinforce that no matter how tough things get, no matter the damage toll, no matter how the, the tragedy, that individually and collectively pulling together, 
No individual, no government, no organisation can do it alone, but together we can. And there is a true sincerity uh, in the investment and the commitment to making a difference coming out of all this to the other side, not just like we were, but something different, something stronger, something more capable to prepare ourselves for the next one uh, uh, and deal with that, respond to that and, rec and recover from that. Healing is the big thing, reaching out and looking out for each other. That's what gives us hope. Thanks. And um, we've just got a, a minute or so left. Um, thanks for that, Shane. Um, so maybe we'll just go to Michael and then we'll finish off with, with Cheryl on, um, on hope. Um, I suppose just, yeah. <laughs> thanks, yeah. Michael. I, I suppose just quickly, well, um, what's the alternative if there's no hope? Um, everybody has, uh, has joined this, uh, this session, um, not because they thought it was hopeless, but because they have hope and they want to affect change. Uh, and I, I suppose my last uh, reflection would be uh, even in adversity, th there's opportunity uh, at a personal level with, uh, with COVID and, uh, uh, and having lockdowns, there's a rediscovery potentially of family values and a connection with family uh, and at a, at a higher level. Um, the impacts for our economy, providing the opportunity to retool and refocus uh, and to build something new. Uh, so that's my two cents. Thanks. Cheryl? Well, I think Shane actually made an excellent response. It's those small acts of, of human kindness and uh, cooperation that is, that is certainly inspiring. But I think sometimes we focus too much on hope that there are other virtues such as joy and grace, which we can find in a blue sky or in the regeneration of forests post the bushfires. And I think we focus too much on the bad things. And I think we can find hope everywhere if we go looking for it. Thanks, wonderful words of wisdom to end this, um, this panel on. So I'd like to, um, on behalf of our audience members and myself and uh, the organising committee, thank you very much for your time today on the panel. Um, it's been a, a really insightful and productive discussion and looking forward to on what, what appears to be some upcoming um, uh, innovations in, in the policy and public program space. So um, thanks again for your time today. And I'm going to, I believe, hand back to Andrew Coughlin, who will then take us into the um, session coming up at two o'clock on it's just disappeared from my screen so um, i'll hand you back to to andrew Cochran. thanks very much thanks melissa and a, a big thanks to our uh panel uh, a virtual round of applause if we could i think some fantastic insights there drawing on very different perspectives people from different levels of government and beyond um, been really good to get those insights i, I was particularly taken early in the piece when toby spoke about the volume and velocity of change. And I think as the session um, unfolded, we heard about the volume and velocity of change in the response and the policy reaction to what's been going on as well. So in a lot of ways, I think that provides a great deal of hope to the swift change and swift action that we're seeing in response to a lot of what's going on is really helping in building that resilience that was talked about.